In this video, you're gonna find me eating an Irish flag colored vegetable platter for lunch. Stand in front of the world's biggest stock exchange for butter. And oh, there are a few heads impaled on the castle walls as well. So what are you waiting for? Impale that like button and let's explore the Irish city of Cork. Welcome to Ireland's second largest city, Cork. And they say that if you go to Dublin, you go for party. But if you come to Cork, you come for Ireland. So I'm really, really interested in what Cork, this really quirky city, has on offer. Of course, the first destination of visit in Cork has to start with the English market. It is the oldest current market in the entire Cork city. And also, it was called English market because of a very strange reason. You see, when established in the 1780s, English market was actually not called English market. But it has this really oppressive rule, you see. Only Protestants can set up shop here in this covered market. And the covered market is very coveted because, you know, you can do trading at all times, regardless of rain or snow, which happens very often here in Ireland. Most of the Irish are actually Catholic, a vast majority of them. So it ends up only being English people who are rich enough to come over here and set up shop can have their own market stalls and marketplace. So it ended up being called English market. Even though technically everyone's eligible, it's just another way for the English monarchy to suppress the Irish people. The second stop is the Red Abbey. You can see this tower behind me was built in the 14th century as an addition to the 13th century compound that housed dozens of friars here on this square. And as you can see, it's now a square. Why? Well, because a fire completely destroyed the entire compound in the 18th century. And this is the only thing that remained. And its historical significance actually comes from the 1690. During the siege of Cork, the Englishmen did basically occupy this entire compound and then they moved their cannons to the top floor and they rained down cannon fire onto the walled city of Cork on the other side of the river over there and basically ended a really, really long siege. And this is just one of the dozens of conflicts between Englishmen as well as Irishmen. But what's more interesting is actually around the corner that I'm gonna show you. Right behind me around the corner, is the Nano Dago place and you can see that it is a beautiful red walled coven that has all kinds of decorations on the walls but what's inside is really really important this is where um, Honora Nago decided that you know what I'm gonna educate Catholic children okay no matter how poor they are and it started with a mud house right behind me and at the time educating Catholic girls even all kinds of girls was punishable by jail time yeah imagine how far we have come huh yeah and then she decided to start a group of people called the presentation sisters and then slowly spread all around the world now they are available to basically teach all kinds of girls as like an education uh, resource uh, on every single major continent and yeah it's pretty impressive it started with a humble beginning here in a mud house in the 1800s and i'm right on top of elizabeth fort which boasts a very beautiful view over the entire cork city you can see everything from here this is because uh, it was a fort built by the british in order to monitor the irish local population in the 1700s so you can see all of the star stout structured but this fort's importance is not just the view and its history, but actually a part of a very, very interesting piece of Irish stories. In the 1800s, um, a lot of these convicts from all around the uh, British Empire were sent into Australia for basically serving their sentences. But uh, here in Ireland, this very, very fort, Elizabeth Fort, was served as the basic last point for all of the females from around the Irish islands. Uh, before their last departure into uh, Australia and New Zealand. It recorded some of the most bizarre and interesting pieces of Irish stories. Uh, a lot of the Irish will get convicted of something small, tiny, such as a theft of a cloth or, you know, just vagrancy, pure vagrancy, just being homeless.
homeless is enough to send you all the way to the other side of the world for seven or ten years and that is absolutely mind-blowing to you guys these days but actually for them at the time it was actually a good deal because you see female convicts from Ireland are generally considered to be very accommodating very easy to take care of and a lot of people actually think that they may have convicted these intentionally because they are so poor they have no husbands no boyfriends nobody to hang on with and this might be a better way to start a new life to steal a piece of cloth and you get like 10 years into a different piece of land where you might you know find new opportunities uh, new people to meet with and mingle with and that might be a very very uh, good opportunity for them because in some letters that some of the English governors have written back home they were just absolutely shocked that they found out that some of the Irish even female convicts are writing to their homes about you know how comfortable it is to be in the jail here in Elizabeth Fort or even uh, to be on the boat where you get actual three meals a day with sometimes pork and beef and actually plum juice that gives you vitamin C originally to avert scurvy but actually like actual good food a lot of them probably have never had such good food and then one of them even said that oh my god I can't believe it a lot of those female convicts are actually rejoicing over the fact that they have their own sheet over their bed and then they are not sharing the sheet or the bed with anyone else even though they have 18 inches of width just to give you an idea 18 inches basically the width of a Ryanair seat yeah wait hold on a second Ryanair is also Irish so the tradition is continuing even nowadays wow fascinating yeah but back to the story so for a lot of these female convicts they might be so poor that they are just homeless that may they may as well just try to steal some things and eventually get convicted so they will actually get a way better life here in the prison because it is generally regarded that these women are very very important once they arrive in the colony they need to be in a very very good health condition uh, when they arrive they cannot be dying because it will just add another layer of burden to the colony right so actually they are provided with different sets of clothes all kinds of working attire and all kinds of other things that they can use in order to arrive comfortably and they are served the proper and good meals on board of this four to five month long journey and yeah it is absolutely incredible and this place uh, Elizabeth Fort is probably the last place they saw before they start their new life in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, after their sentence is over, usually seven to 10 years, uh, they will get basically freed. They'll get their sentence to say, oh, you're free. But they are usually way too poor to afford a journey back here into Ireland. So they will basically stay there and become mothers of Australia, Tasmania, and New Zealand. And yeah, it's really interesting that nowadays, one out of every 10 Australian can trace their ancestry here into this fort's records because uh, there's so many female convicts were sent from here in Ireland into Tasmania and Australia. In fact, about half of the female convicts sent there are Irish. Welcome to St. Finvar's Cathedral. And you can see this is a gorgeous, gorgeous church. Yeah, it is dedicated to the patron saint of Cork, St. Finvar. It is said that the architect wanted to make this church the most magnificent one in the entire island and then he started building it. And then halfway through, he realized that if he finished what he designed, he will be way, way over budget. So do you know what he decided to do? Well, he decided to make the facade and the outside as lavish, extravagant and ornate as possible and made the center and the inside very, very small. And that is what we in the industry calls a shower, not a grower. But even if it is just a shower, the outside is definitely a gorgeous place. Honestly, on a day of cold Irish winter like this, nothing beats a very, very big serving of Irish stew. Oh my god, look at this. Oh, 
Oh, look at the mashed potatoes and vegetables. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm gonna enjoy this a lot. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah, it's still piping hot. The steam is still rising up. Oh. Mm. Mm. oh my god, I just realized that this is the Irish black color. Look at this. University College Cork which is probably one of the most beautiful universities out there in Ireland it was founded in 1849 commissioned by the Queen so it was originally named after Queen Victoria well of course after independence it was renamed to University College Cork shortened to UCC it has been serving students since its foundation in 1949 and it has a beautiful campus yeah they say that actually the inner halls and some parts of the outside were comparable to even Hogwarts and uh, speculatively chosen as locations to film the Harry Potter series and the absolute landmark of Cork has to be this St. Anne's Cathedral wow this is probably the tallest point around and you can see the clock over there yeah it's not correct it's like four minutes ahead yeah so they always call it the four-faced liar because you can always see there's another clock on the other side the church has a very beautiful nave don't get me wrong but the best thing has to be this gorgeous view look at this you can see basically the entire cork town from here all the way probably to the sea on a good day yeah and then you can see basically every single prominent building like the first church down here and university over there all the way down to St. Finbar that we just passed through over there Elizabeth Fort probably also around there yeah wow look at this oh yeah down here is a more commercial district the historical commercial district see that the fur king crane yeah there used to be a huge crane housed in this building and it was used to transport a lot of goods to the dog side and down here see that building over there this one oh yeah that was a butter exchange move over new york you may have a stock exchange cork had a butter exchange okay it was so big on butter that it is basically the center of all butter trade and in fact the city actually created an official butter museum inside they actually have some really interesting artifacts the Irish people have been making butter since basically the beginning of time there's the oldest stick of butter in the entire world dug up from an old bog that's more than 1200 years old imagine that and apparently according to experts it is still edible you can still eat a stick of butter from 1200 years ago yeah according to my personal expert opinion I would not try that but yeah it's on exhibition in that building and in the recent history a little bit more recent in the 1700s and 1800s Ireland become basically the exporter of butter to the entire world ranging from India to the Americas so this city Cork became the center of every single butter trade it was so so important that this building the butter exchange had to be formed because otherwise it will be very difficult to regulate all of the trade that's coming through cork yeah basically 90 percent of the world's butter export import and all the trade take place in this building and it was so important that you can see on the top instead of hanging with some angel or jesus christ it's the head of a cow <laughs>
nothing can beat a very very Irish dinner at the very famous restaurant here in Market Lane and uh, yeah they have their own beer in a microbrewery just next door they call it elbow lane for something yeah it's some kind of historical reference but I'm just appreciating how good the beer is you can see I already finished like half of it oh yeah I'm not red yet right I'm not drunk yet okay yeah look at this it's a bacon collar on a very um, creamy mashed potato base oh look at that mm. um, oh yeah buttered to the perfection and that is it of my brief excursion to the second largest city of Ireland Cork I took the short bus ride to the airport and hopped onto an hour-long Aer Lingus flight towards London. If you have watched the beginning of this mega trip that lasted more than two months, you will know that this leg was necessary in order for my business class flight from New York to London and back to be kept under the price of an economy class ticket. I quickly landed at the imperial capital and spent a pleasant evening with my friends visiting their favorite bars and restaurants. Oh don't worry, I'll come back in the next trip as well. Because if you know travel hacking like I do, the world is truly your oyster and you can be anywhere, anytime you wish. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel as I share secrets about how I can travel around the world without breaking the bank. And oh, I think you will also really enjoy my review of the JetBlue Airways A321 Business Class. This is the best product they have on offer and I will link it to the top right right here. Seriously, go check it out. I think it is one of the most astounding business class that I managed to enjoy for less than $300. And after landing in New York City, I took a quick flight towards the northwest corner of the country in Seattle and simply bought a few samosas in my favorite stall in the Pike Street Market. And with that, my trip officially came to a close. Nearly 10,000 miles of journey across multiple continents ended here. And I sincerely hope you enjoyed this series and let's look back to the best moments we have had in this wonderful journey. So you do the part where you hit the like button and I will do the part where I conjure up some authentic Irish pub music. I will see you around.